Hail and welcome, Paul here once again. Now, in my last lecture, we talked about Clovis, King of the Franks, how he converted to Christianity after the Battle of Tolbiac and would bring most of Gaul firmly into his grip with his military conquests. After his death in 511, he would divide his kingdom equally amongst his sons, following the Germanic inheritance laws that the Franks were known to practice. This practice would inevitably just ask for dynastic rivalry. So Clovis had four sons, Clothar, Clodomer, Childebert, and Theuderic. Clothar ruled in the kingdom of Soissons, which took up modern-day Belgium and part of northeastern France. Clodomer ruled in the kingdom of Orléans, right in the heart of France. Childebert ruled in the kingdom of Paris, and he also had lordship over Aquitaine, which had previously belonged to the Visigoths. And Theuderic ruled in the Kingdom of Reims, also known as Metz, which took up much of northeastern France into Germany and parts of the Netherlands, so around the Rhine River, and was also overlord of the Alamanni around modern-day Switzerland, and also ruled Le Mans. Although there was tension amongst them, they would also often cooperate to extend Frankish dominion to their neighbors. In the 530s, they successfully annexed Burgundy and divided that kingdom equally amongst themselves. They also conquered Thuringia and took Provence from the Ostrogoths. Unfortunately, Clodomer would be killed in one of the Burgundian campaigns in 523. He died without having any sons, so his three remaining brothers would split parts of his kingdom amongst themselves. Theuderic died in 534, also in a battle against the Burgundians. His son, Theudebert, would come to rule the Kingdom of Reims, which would, in his reign, come to be known as Austrasia. Since Clodomer didn't have any sons, his former territory would be split between the two brothers and their nephew. After Theudebert died, his son Theudebald would rule Austrasia. However, Theudobald would die in 555, and Clothar would opportunistically take Austrasia for himself. In 558, Childebert died. Like Clodomer, Childebert died without having any sons. So now Clothar is king of all the Frankish realms. However, in keeping with Salic law, Clothar too had four sons, and then those four sons would once again divide the realm into four separate kingdoms. Though, over the years, the kingdoms of Paris, Orléans, and the southern portion of Soissons would merge to make up the kingdom of Neustria, which was the name of that territory during Clovis' reign. So now the two main Frankish kingdoms are Austrasia, which took up Belgium, parts of Western Germany, Luxembourg, the Southeastern Netherlands, and parts of Northeastern France. And the Kingdom of Neustria, in what is today the bulk of Northern France. The Franks would also exert their influence over Burgundy and Aquitaine. Now, the territories of Neustria and Austrasia were not static, and the frontiers would change often throughout the course of this period. Now, as fair as dividing your territory amongst your sons seems, 
it was also counterproductive, as it caused the Merovingians to essentially weaken themselves gradually. And we see this in the case of Brunhilde. Now, if you're familiar with Norse mythology, when you hear Brunhilde, you probably think of the famous Valkyrie. And I'll explain shortly how a Christian Frankish queen became a pagan Valkyrie. So, Brunhilde was a Visigothic princess, and in 567, she married one of Clothar's sons, Siegbert of Austrasia. After their marriage, she held the title of Queen Consort, meaning that although she was the wife of the king, she wasn't very powerful in her own right. After Siegbert's death in 575, she gained the title of Queen Regent, meaning she was able to rule by and large behind the scenes during the reign of their son, Childebert. At first, she had the respect of the people. She had a close relationship with the papacy, as she converted from Arianism to Catholicism. She supported missionary work, but throughout the end of her life, we see her begin to fall into corruption. First, after Siegbert's death, she married her own nephew, whose name was Merovich, to maintain stability in the realm, though he would be confined to a monastery. Then she began to rule as queen regent for her son Childebert, ruling both Austrasia and Burgundy. After Childebert's death, she attempted to set herself up as the regent of both his sons, Theodoric of Burgundy and Theodobert of Austrasia. However, she would be exiled from Theodobert's court in 599, and her power would be confined to Burgundy. Thirteen years later, in 612, she would set Theodoric up to murder Theodobert to seize the throne of Austrasia. She was successful. However, Theodoric died in the following year, and she unsuccessfully attempted to install her great-grandson, Siegbert II, as king. However, the Austrasian nobility would ally themselves with Brunhilde's nephew, Clothar II, king of Neustria, in a rebellion against her. She tried in vain to recruit warriors from east of the Rhine in modern-day Germany, but would then exile herself to Burgundy. However, she would find no refuge there, as Burgundy and Austrasia at the time shared a mayor of the palace. What is a mayor of the palace? Basically like a lieutenant to a Frankish king, the mayor of the palace was the one making important political and military decisions. It would eventually come to a point where the Merovingian kings would become nothing more than figureheads, with the palace mayors holding the real power. More on that later. Well... When Brunhilde's army of German mercenaries met with Clothar II's army, they refused to fight and handed her over to be executed. The nearly 80-year-old queen would be tortured for days, supposedly dragged through the streets with her hair tied to a mare's tail. And then finally, she was executed by being tied to four strong stallions that tore her limb from limb. Clothar also executed her great-grandson, Siegbert, and in doing so, put Austrasia and Burgundy under Neustrian rule, reuniting much of Clovis's kingdom. Now, as I said before, Brunhilde would become a figure in Germanic mythology. 
In the 13th century, she was a leading character in the German epic The Nibelung Lied, or The Song of the Nibelungs. This story takes historical figures from the 5th and 6th centuries and creates an epic poem full of courtly love and revenge, as well as dragon slaying, a cunning dwarf, and a magic treasure hoard. The story is in no way supposed to be a historic account, but a fantasy tale only loosely based on figures and events from 600-700 years prior. We see this theme in a lot of stories written from the latter half of the early Middle Ages going into the High Middle Ages. Stories that use the 5th and 6th centuries as the backdrop for fantastical heroic legends and sagas. Two other notable examples would be King Arthur and Beowulf. In the story, Siegfried, who is based on Brunhilde's husband, Siegbert, marries a Burgundian princess named Kriemhild, sister of King Gunther, the first historically attested king of Burgundy. Gunther agrees to let Siegfried marry his sister if he acquires for him the warrior queen Brunhild, who in the story for some reason is the queen of Iceland. Really strange as she was originally from Spain, ruling in what is now Belgium and Western Germany. And Iceland wasn't even discovered until the 9th century. Well, the arranged marriages would lead to a rivalry between Brunhild and Kriemhild, which would end in Siegfried's murder. In that same century, a collection of poems were written in Iceland that told the old Norse and Germanic myths that would have been handed down from generation to generation throughout the centuries, even after the Christianization of the Scandinavian peoples, who were the last Germanic ethnic group to convert in the early Middle Ages. These poems would be compiled into what would be called the Poetic Edda, which would be divided into two parts. The mythological lays, the stories of the heathen gods, such as Odin, Thor, Tyr, all dwelling in Asgard, fighting beasts and giants and going on adventures. And then you had the heroic lays, which parallel the Nibelung lead, and would be made into its own saga, the saga of the Volsungs, or the Volsunga saga. This version still has that backdrop of Northern and Central Europe in the 5th and 6th centuries, but it creates a world where the god Odin walks amongst mortals and meddles in earthly affairs. In this version, Siegfried goes by the name of Sigurd, and Brunhild is no mortal warrior queen, but the queen of the Valkyries, supernatural shield maidens in the service of Odin, who are tasked with carrying the dead from the battlefield to Valhalla, the Hall of the Slain. What a stretch that is. For Brunhilde to go from being a Christian, Gothic, Frankish queen to being a supernatural being in pagan mythology. But it worked. In the late 19th century, composer Richard Wagner would take elements of both the German and Icelandic versions of the story to create his opera, The Ring of the Nibelungs, bringing the legend of Brunhilde to a new audience. Now back to the actual history. Clothar II's rise to the top was full of turmoil and strife. He was the son of Chilperic I, who was the son of Clovis's son, Clothar I. He would be crowned as an infant following the assassination of his father, with his mother Fritigund 
ruling for him as Queen Regent. Fredegund would secure the throne of Neustria for Clothar by murdering all potential dynastic rivals, which started during the reign of her husband. She assassinated Brunhilde's sister Galswintha in 568, who was married to Fredegund's husband before her, and also ordered for Sigbert to be assassinated which would spark a feud between Neustria and Austrasia. After Fritigan's death in 597, Clothar would come of age and grow into a powerful king in his own right. After ordering the execution of Brunhilde and her great-grandson, there was nothing standing in the way of Clothar II becoming Rex Francorum, King of the Franks. In 614, he issued the Edict of Paris, a series of legal ordinances outlining the power of nobles and the church. While the purpose of the edict was initially to end corruption and ensure justice, it ended up entrenching tension between the kingdoms of the Franks. By 623, the Austrasians were yearning for a king of their own. In an attempt to not compromise the power of his line, Clothar appointed his son Dagobert to rule over Austrasia, while Clothar would primarily rule in Neustria. After Clothar's death in 629, Dagobert would become Rex Francorum, and he was the last Merovingian king of the Franks to wield any true power. Dagobert secured his realm by allying himself with the Byzantine Emperor Heraclius. He would also subdue the Bretons of Armorica and the Basques in Gascony. In 631, he led a campaign against the king of the Slavic Wends, Samo, whose dominion stretched throughout what is now Slovenia, Austria, Slovakia, the Czech Republic, and southwestern Poland. This campaign led to the Battle of Wolgastisburg. In this battle, Dagobert would lead into Samo's Slavic Empire a confederation of Austrasian Franks, Alemanni, and Lombards, a Germanic tribe that took over Italy 63 years prior. This battle would prove to be too ambitious of an attempt of Dagobert. The Wends were victorious, and they successfully pushed the Franks out of their lands. Dagobert's Alemannic and Lombard allies would, however, confine the Wends to their Slavic territory, preventing any retaliatory attacks. Dagobert's reign was certainly prosperous. Not only was he a fierce warlord, but also a connoisseur in art and culture. He would establish an abbey dedicated to the 3rd century Bishop of Paris, Saint-Denis. In the centuries after Dagobert, this abbey would grow into one of France's most important basilicas, and Saint-Denis would become the patron saint of France. However, Dagobert's power would wane in the last seven years of his reign. In 632, the nobles of Austrasia revolted against Dagobert in consort with their mayor of the palace, Pepin of Landen whose descendants would become important in my next lecture. Once again, the Austrasians were yearning for their own king and independence from Neustrian influence. In an attempt to maintain his power, he put his three-year-old son, Siegbert III, on the Austrasian throne. Now, being a small child, obviously Siegbert 
could not lead armies. He could not deal with church matters. He could not manage treasuries. He could not make important political decisions. The things that a king is supposed to be able to do. So the power of Austrasia really laid in the hands of the mayors of the palace. After his death, his other son, Clovis II, would become king of Neustria and Burgundy. However, like Siegbert of Austrasia, Clovis II was but a child. He was only six years old when his reign began. The mayors of the palace were the true administrators of Neustria and Austrasia, and for the next century, Dagobert's successors would become known as the Roy Fainéant, the do-nothing kings. Going into the 8th century, the descendants of the mayor of the palace of Austrasia, Pepin of Landen, would create a dynasty of their own, who would claim the title King of the Franks for themselves. But that is a story for next time. Salute.